Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hey everyone, in this episode, I'm going to be tackling a chicken and the egg question. And this chicken and the egg question idea comes from listener Firas Halawani. And I'm just going to jump right into it and see what his question is without a long preamble. So here's what he asks. Hey, Scott, I've enjoyed your series on Ottoman lives. And that was a series I did on different people in the Ottoman Empire, like the Sultan, the Janissary, the eunuch, etc. I'm researching on why the Ottomans didn't adopt the printing press when it was invented. Any insights or references or similar findings is appreciated. Thank you. All right, Firas, that is your chicken and the egg question. And he didn't ask it in that way, but here's what I'm getting at. How does technology affect society? Does technology determine human action or does human action determine technology? In the former, that technology determines human action, some people might think that there's really only one pathway that technology can work. For example, with an airplane, The way that physics is set up, there's not that many ways that you can design an airplane. You have to have wings that create drag that cause lift. You can't have kooky inventions like they had in the early 1900s, early 1800s, where people had flapping bat wings like you see in the old-timey footage, black and white footage of people having these silly little contraptions and flying machines. Those just don't work according to the laws of physics. There's really only about one way an airplane can work. So for that reason, any society, they could have arrived at the airplane independently, but it's going to look a certain way and people will see the practical advantages of flight and society will follow along and society will be changed by flight. You see airports crop up. You see the way that people conceive of distance differently. That's a case where technology really leads things and technology affects human society. There's another perspective where society affects how they receive technology. This is putting the cart and the horse in different places. They would say that whether or not a technology is considered useful depends on what society that technology is being presented to. Some people might think flight is useful. A tribe in the Amazon might think, why on earth would we need this? This doesn't help me hunt animals more effectively. It doesn't help me survive being killed by a boa constrictor or a piranha. So who cares about this? Now, this question, this chicken and the egg, this might seem kind of esoteric, but I came across this question pretty early in my graduate studies. Early in my graduate program, I wrote a 50-page paper on clocks in the Ottoman Empire. And if you think that's completely ridiculous and why on earth would anyone do that? Well, if you've been with me this long in this podcasting journey, you probably understand why this is a good question. And if you think it's stupid, you probably quit this podcast a long time ago. So that's how I'm self-selective. I face the same question where historians had different ideas about clocks and they were looking at the introduction of clocks in the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s in Europe. And the question was this, why were all these clock towers being built in public squares in European towns and cities when Until the invention of the pendulum in the 1500s, clocks really weren't all that accurate. They would have to be readjusted constantly, and you would have to use an accurate timekeeping device, like a water clock or a sundial, basically, to make sure your clock was accurate. But if you have a timekeeping device that really can't keep time on its own, why on earth did people build it? Now, people and historians have different theories. Some would say that With the emergence of mercantilism and guilds in the late Middle Ages, you had to find a way to quantify your time because now you were charging people for your billable hours. So when you go into town, you need to be able to point to a timekeeping device and show that, well, I worked for two hours, I need to be paid this amount. They would say that necessity is the mother of invention. There was a need for quantifiable time, so that's why clocks came about. Even though they weren't all that accurate, there was a social need for it. So Later on, they did become more accurate, but that was a reason. Others would say that the technology showed up and then society just sort of built up around it. Timekeeping devices were more of an artistic curiosity and they were flashy displays in a town square. And even if they weren't all that accurate, there wasn't that much of a social need for accurate timekeeping. But 
It was an ornate, beautiful device to have in a town square, kind of like a glockenspiel or a cuckoo clock, something nice to have. But as he started to pop up and appear, then there was a whole cottage industry of craftsmen that built up around timekeeping devices, and then they became more accurate over time. So there are different approaches to this. And one theory that I was exposed to in my graduate study was called the social construction of technological systems. And this is based on a 1987 edited volume by Thomas Hughes, Trevor Pinch, and Weeby Beaker. And this is what the theory says, that technology doesn't determine human action, but human action shapes technology. They would say that the ways a technology is used can't be understood without understanding how that technology is embedded in its social context. So this theory called the Scott theory, the social construction of technology theory, they hold that to understand the reasons that a society accepts or rejects technology should look to their social world. You can't just explain a technology success by saying it's the best technology, but researchers have to look at the criteria of how the best is defined in a society and what groups and stakeholders participate in defining it. So they ask who defines a technical criteria and why technical criteria are defined this way and who is included or excluded. So one example, when I looked at clocks in the Ottoman Empire, I saw that timekeeping devices spread all over Europe by the 15th, 16th centuries. You had clocks in town squares. You had astronomical clocks that could follow the phases of the moon and planetary motion. But in the Ottoman Empire, you didn't have clocks in the same way. They were gifted to the sultan by European ambassadors. And then you start seeing clocks appear in the 1700s and 1800s when Ottoman citizens are interested in European goods and clocks are seen as being French. So they might buy a grandfather clock or they might buy a pocket watch. But the need for timekeeping wasn't really there. There really wasn't a huge need for timekeeping until the 19th century when you have postal systems and steamships that have to follow a certain timetable down to the hour. And even up into the 20th century, Ottoman clocks were different. They would follow a system where during daylight there was 12 hours, regardless of whether it was summer or winter. So some clocks in Ottoman households had to be reset every single day so that sunrise was 12 o'clock. Then sunset was 12 o'clock and hours would bend and flex because it was considered better that clocks would follow environmental conditions and not 24 hours, regardless of what your actual sunlight conditions were. So this is an example of how the uses of timekeeping was just considered in a different way in an Ottoman context. It wasn't as if suddenly mechanical clocks appear and everyone's conception of time changes. And Mechanical clocks were introduced, but they were used in very different ways in the Ottoman Empire than in Europe. For example, Sultan Abdul Hamid, who ruled in the late 1800s, received a special pocket watch from a German clockmaker who lived in Constantinople. And this was a mechanical clock that could tell Sultan Abdul Hamid the times to pray, according to Islamic tradition, every day. Now, that's a hard thing to do with a mechanical clock because... A Muslim prays five times a day, but the times at which he prays differ according to the position of the sun in the sky. So this mechanical clock could tell him different times of the day throughout the year when to pray. So this is a very sophisticated system, and it's much more complicated than your regular clock. But this is something that was considered more advantageous socially than something that would be in Europe. And I said at the top of this episode, I wouldn't do a long preamble, but I guess I did. So The reason I went to that long preamble was to show you what I'm talking about here with Firas's question about the Ottoman Empire and why there weren't printing presses the same way there were in Europe. And this is a question that researchers have asked for a long time. The Gutenberg printing press explodes across Europe, but it's really not that popular in the Ottoman Empire until the 19th century. It lags by several centuries. Why is that? Is technology seen as being un-Islamic to some people? Yes, it was. But what do we mean by technology? And do they mean all technology? Well, for a lot of things, the Ottomans could be ahead of the curve, according to Europeans. And a lot of technology like guns or cannons or ships were readily adopted by the Ottomans. They had no problem with it. So what happened with the printing press? Why doesn't it show up till much later? 
That's what we're going to be tackling in this episode. And because I study the Ottoman Empire in my background, I like to compare it to Europe because there's so many similarities and so many differences, it makes for a good A-B testing case study. I've done this with the history of prostitution, with the history of copyright law, the history of slavery, and all sorts of other things. So let's start off first with the printing press and how it spread through Europe, and then we're going to look at theories on why it didn't spread in the Middle East. And then we're going to look at what sultans themselves actually said, what religious figures actually said, how the printing press comes to the Ottoman Empire, and what people thought of it then. And I hope that you come away from this episode, not just with some random facts about the printing press, but really the bigger question of how does society deal with technology? And this is an ever-pressing issue in the 21st century with smartphones. Just because we have a smartphone, do we blindly do what our technology tells us to do and we become addicted to it without thinking of it? We become addicted to it without thinking the consequences? Do we try to have mastery over it and decide the terms in which we'll engage our technology? These are pressing questions in the 21st century, but they're not new questions. This is something that societies have dealt with for since human civilization has existed. So let's jump right into it. The printing press was invented in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg in Germany in 1439. It took 400 years, but this printing technology spread to all regions of the world, displacing the manuscript or writing by hand and block printing. Printing presses were set up in Central and Western Europe. Major town functions as centers of diffusion. Printing presses come to Cologne in 1466, Rome in 1467, Venice in 1469, Paris in 1470, Krakow in 1473, London in 1477, and by 1481, there were 21 print shops in the Netherlands, and Italy and Germany had print shops in 40 towns. By 1500, there were about a thousand printing presses in operation throughout Western Europe. They produced 8 million books. In the 1550s, there were 300 or more printers and booksellers in Geneva alone. The output was on the order of about 20 million volumes. In the 16th century, this rode tenfold to between 150 and 200 million volumes. And you can hear more about this in the episode I did on copyright law, where with the explosion of printing presses, now you have legal questions about copying someone else's works and plagiarism and other things. But there were few printing presses in the Ottoman Empire until the 1800s. They arrived intermittently here and there, especially among minority populations in the Ottoman Empire, and I'll talk more about those later. So you see one here in the 1500s. You see a tinkerer experimenting with books printed in Turkish in the 1700s, but they're not really set up throughout the empire until the 1800s. Why is that? One theory by the Ottoman historian Soraya Farouki is the lack of interest, and religious reasons were among the reasons for their slow adoption. So the printing in Arabic, or in the Arabic script, which you see in the Turkish language and the Persian language and other languages, it encountered opposition by Muslim legal scholars and manuscript scribes. For that reason, printing presses were prohibited in the Ottoman Empire between 1483 and 1729 on penalty of death. I'm not saying this is true or not. I'm just talking about ideas put forward. While there was some Arabic type printing done, but this was done in Europe or in Christian parts of the Middle East for distribution among Middle Eastern Christians who spoke Arabic. And the oldest Quran printed with movable type was done in Venice in 1537 for the Ottoman market. First, let me give an overview of what was happening in the Ottoman Empire. And a lot of this information comes from an article by Ekrem Ekinji in Daily Sabah. So the Ottomans weren't ignorant about printing. They knew about it long before there was a huge print system in their own empire. The traveler Evliya Chalebi, who wrote a long travel log in the 17th century, talked about printing presses that he saw in Vienna, and it was something familiar in his works. Like I said, the first book in Arabic was published in Italy in 1514. Books in Arabic and Farsi were also published in Venice, Rome, and Vienna by humanist scholars who were interested in Semitic culture. These were usually books that merchants and missionaries could make use of. So you also have the Counter-Reformation with Catholic missionaries going to the Middle East to try to convert Orthodox Christians there to Catholicism. There were printing houses in Istanbul in the 15th century at the early years of printing. But these books weren't printed in Turkish. 